Connect card again. Don't forget, dads, we're going to do a uh, drawing right after the service for NFL tickets. So you're going to want to get your name on there. And the word dad would help um, if you put it. And you can turn with me to the book of Colossians. We're going to be here for one verse, and then we're going to go to the Gospel of Luke. You know, Paul's been talking about husbands. He's been talking about wives. He's going to talk about fathers. He has one verse for you dads. Should note to self, stop giving out caffeine and service and M&Ms. You got men are jacked up, hyped up. They can't calm down. I don't know. I'm excited. I have to confess, I had a big bag of M&M cookies in the first service, so I am jacked up. So, <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. I want to unpack what this means by a story that we're going to look at. Of, of the opposite of this. Of, when you embitter your children, you give them a standard they can't reach. You, you give them performance-based love. You give them harshness and rules and legalism. You give them commands, and, but you don't give them your heart. And God's the kind of father that gives us his heart, and he fathers us out of a heart that encourages us, not out of a harshness that discourages us. I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Jesus tells three stories about lost things, a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. You know, for those that are watching online, I wish you a happy Father's Day. I know we have a growing audience online, and we're grateful that you join us uh, that way. You know, I heard a story this past week that just illustrates the power of a father's words. A young man knew from early on that he was going to be an Olympic runner. He had committed his life to win an Olympic gold medal. He had gotten to the place where he would qualify for the United States in the Olympics. He had one person that was his nemesis to beat that always had him by about a half a second. He took his films of that, that individual and he watched them over and over and he broke them down per segment so he could watch what his steps were in his mind. He contemplated, studied, and trained to beat that young man. At the moment he came to the starting blocks at the Olympics, as he got down, and you know, and, and when you're in any kind of a, a, a sprint run, it's the start that, that determines the finish. It's how you get off the blocks. He's on there. He's, 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 he's contemplating every move. Good runners think through every step before they take them. And out of the blue, the thought comes into his mind, I wonder if my dad is watching. Out of the blue. Then he remembered these words. You're a loser, you'll never amount to anything. Those are the words that the father branded and tattooed into the spirit, the scars that he still bore many years later in the most strategic moment that he dreamed of his entire life. Not words that would come back to inspire and to encourage and to give him that extra to get over the finish line, but words that took life from him, words that put curses on him, the Father's words can be so destructive, unintentionally or intentionally. In stupidity, he may have been drunk. It could have been his, his own dad could have said that to him. The, the son could have done something horrible at that moment to, to, to just ignite the, the anger. Whatever excuse that you want to make, the reality is many of us can wear words that fathers have put on us that are not healthy, good, life-giving words. And I want to just challenge you men this morning. If you're living under some of those words, if you don't deal with them properly and forgive and release, you'll carry them on unintentionally, but you'll carry on the curse in your own life. It has to stop with you. It stops in your life. You have to take a stand and say, not on my watch, but it can't be done in your own strength. It has to be done through grace and forgiveness. I want to give you the model of a father that I think all of us would have wished that we grew up with, but he's just a beautiful picture of our heavenly father. In Luke chapter 15, I want you to look with me in, in the beginning of the story. I know it's very familiar. Verse 11 of chapter 15. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got all, got all his stuff together. He set off to a 
distant country. In the old English King James Version, it called it a far country. I like that concept of it's far from what? Far from who? The Father. A distant country, far from the Father. There he squandered his wealth and wild living. Now, we'll come back to this story in a moment. I just want to talk a little bit about the Father. Why would he give him his money? Basically, the son said, I don't care about you. You might as well be dead because I want your stuff. I don't want you. I want what you have to give me. I don't want to be with you. Now, I don't believe it's because he was an oppressive, harsh father. I know this because in the son's lowest moment, what does he do? He comes back to this man. If he was a harsh, horrible dad, you're, not going, you're going to find someone else to go. Let me tell you something. Number one, dads. This father, what he did right was, I'm sure he made mistakes and he failed in different ways, but one of the things he did right is he put home in the heart of his child. First role, I think of a father's role and a mother, is that you teach your children where home is. Now, that's not, home isn't an address. It's not a zip code. It's a person. Home is not somewhere where you lived. It's someone you lived with. Home can be traveling. We had a, a, a friend of ours, and, and he played NFL football, and he married his wife, grew up as a migrant. And she traveled from city to city to city. And they had this community. of They were farm, farmers, and they would pick crops, and they would sing together and cook together. And they never had, barely ever had a place they called home. But they had more home than some of us that had places we called home home. Home's not defined by walls. It's defined by love. And dads, your primary role is to put roots and wings on your children. Roots that they're rooted in who Jesus Christ is, that he loves them and that you love them, that you show them the father's love. The only God that they know about when they're babies is you. The only God they know about when they're two and three is you. And you need to deposit in them love that is not based on them doing something to earn or to, get, to, to deserve it. A father teaches his children that he is home. Now, I get it. You may not have grown up that way. You may not have been that way with your children. But you're, it's never too late to become the father God's called you to be. For some of you today, it might be in forgiving a dad that deeply, deeply failed you. Others, it might be you asking for forgiveness from your children. Do you know that I've said countless fathers over the years that have written notes, made phone calls, sent letters to children saying, I'm sorry I failed you as a father. I'm sorry I wasn't there when you needed me. I want you to know I pray for you every day. I'll never forget one of my dear friends. His name was Jeff. He's the first person we baptized in this church. And Jeff was a cocaine addict I went to high school with, played football with, a wonderful person, but cocaine was destroying his life. He was the prodigal son and made a baby. Do you know a lot of prodigal sons make children? Let me just tell you on the outset, making a baby doesn't make you a father. It means you have sperm. That's all it means. Being a father is something you earn the right to be called father. By second, prodigal sons make horrible fathers. They're more consumed with themselves, their pleasure, their hobbies, their video games, than they are of giving their life for another. Fathers, if they're anything, they're sacrificial. My friend Jeff came back home to Fort Myers, and we had just started this church, and he came to Christ. We, we, we baptized him. He was the first person that we baptized in this church. He looked better then he'd come, come get in his heart with Christ. He'd been working out. He looked like he did in high school. He looked like a Greek god. I mean, just as a handsome, handsome, handsome man. I love Jeff. Jeff's wife that he impregnated, that he made a baby, that he had nothing to do with, she dropped dead of a heart attack. And at age 12, he inherited a 12-year-old. He'd never been able to be a part of her life. Because God, I'm not saying anything about the mother, but God entrusted her back with him because he became the man that she needed him to be. He had been praying for her. He had been sending her notes. He couldn't do it legally, but God made a way for her to be reunited with her father. Let me just say this. It's never too late to find the courage to be the dad that God has called you to be. So don't think, well, my kids are already grown. They're already, no, it's not too late. Let God do in you 
what he needs to do. This dad let his son go, and there are times you have to let your children go. You give them roots so that they know who they are. You give them wings so that they can fly on their own. I didn't want my daughters living with me the rest of my life. Now, they were very pretty, so I knew that they were going to get a man. That the hard part was finding a good man that they could find and that they could marry. So we prayed. We prayed since they were born. We prayed when they were in mama's womb that God would give them good men. And I'm grateful to God that I have three son-in-laws right now that I don't fear them with my daughters. My daughters are safe with them. They're providers. They're workers. They're hardworking. They're diligent. They're good to my grandbabies. And they've earned the right. I have son-in-laws that have earned the right to be dads. My one oldest granddaughter, her dad did not come to her own graduation. One of the lowest moments of my life that he didn't show up for that. You've got to show up if you're a dad. You don't hold things against a child and become like a child. You show up. But her stepdad, who was a teacher of the school, got to walk with her and escort her to get her. He earned the right of the title dad. I don't know that she calls him dad. But he's been more of a dad than her dad has been a dad. Being a dad takes courage not to run, not to give up, not to quit. And when your kids are acting like rebellious, horrible kids, you don't become like them. The dad let them go. That's a hard day. We've been there with our children. It's never fun to release. But you have to release knowing that God didn't let go. Amen? What do you think that dad did? He did two things every day. I believe this. Look what it says. When the son, you know the story, he goes into famine and he loses everything and he's feeding pigs. He's starving to death. He decides, I got to go home. I'm dying. I can at least go home and be a slave to my, my be a servant to my father's house. And I got to go home. I'm dying. He had nowhere to go. He knew where home was. On his way home, it says in verse 20, it says, so when he got up and he went to his father, while he was still a long ways off, he saw, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. How did the father see him? I want to see hands and it's got to be a dad. How did the father see him a long ways off? Was he just got up coincidence and how did he see? What do you think? He felt a sense. There was some kind of sense going on, connected something, stirring. What else? What else? Why was he, why, why did he see him a long ways off? Yes, sir. Say it again. Maybe he had a dream that he was coming home. Okay, make it real practical. Real practical. Lewis. He was praying for his son, and because he prayed, what was he doing every day? He was looking for him. He wasn't sitting on the porch. He was standing out on the hill. He's looking every what is there he goes again. He's walking out. He's a little senile. I don't think he's well rounded. He just stands up there and he cries. We hear him talking to God and he's crying out. He's never giving up. See, fathers find the courage to never give up. When your children give up, you don't give up. When others give up, you don't give up. He never gave up hope, faith, because he had done the hard work. He had made deposits, planted seeds. He knew where home was. He kept the light on. Why is the light on? Because my son's going to come home. You've been saying that for months. I may say it for years, but I'm not going to give up. The second thing, I'll jump ahead in the story. I know he did this every day. When he got back from looking for his son, he didn't come that day. He could have been a little discouraged, but you know what? Faith always has actions. He went in and he grabbed a handful of seed, the best grain that they could find. And he walked in the corral where there's this little calf named Celebration. Hey, celebration, how you doing? Eat some of this grain. I'm going to kill you soon. <laughs> Every day he fed that fatted cat. How do you think he got fat? He fed it. Why did he feed it? Because my son's going to come home. How do you know? Because I put roots in him. And I've got my health and my heart with God crying out. I believe God will honor the seed that's been sown. And it'll come. Now, if you don't sow seed, you've got a tough job ahead of you. You've got to pray for God to get seed in them. If they don't know where home is, you've got to help. You've got to pray. You've got to pray that God will put people in their path. Listen to me, we have a whole generation of kids growing up. They don't know to come back to church. They never left it. They never went to it. We think, well, when they're old, they'll come. They will come back to what? Families today spend more time raising their kids to come back to, to sports. What do you do when it's to go to sports? Let me tell you something, when time is tough, 
You're never going to look back and wish, I wish I'd taken my kids to one more practice. No, you just said, I wish I had them in church every week. I wish I'd embedded them in the home that we read the Bible, that we prayed together. You're never going to look back and say, man, I wish I'd have gone to one more soccer game, one more football game, one more, I wish I'd have just gone one more game. That game is not going to anchor them. That practice is not going to give them somewhere to come home when there's nowhere else to go. I'm not anti-sports, but I'm saying let's get some perspective here. Your kid's not going to go to the NBA. Let me help you. He's not going to be the next Pele. But they don't, you don't even know who that is. You're too, too young. He's not gonna, you're, 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 your kid's going to need Jesus. My kids never grew up wondering, what are we going to do on Sunday? And you say, well, you were the, I don't care whether I was a pastor or not. My kids are going to be in church. Not legalism. It was fun. It was life. It was just part of life. They never got up on Monday morning going, I wonder what I should do today. You're going to school. <laughs> they didn't get up going, I don't know. I'm not feeling like it today. Bucket of water. Boosh. Did I ever do that? Something like that. Shoot, they always, the stories always grow, you know. He lit my bed on fire when I wouldn't get out. And, you know, they, they just grow. They tell their kids, oh, you have no idea. My father, he had switches that were like baseball bats. And, and he beat us till we couldn't move. And we were, ah, blah, blah, blah. But they came home. Must not have been that bad. Come on. Listen to me. This father looked every day. Don't give up, man. Don't give up. If you give up, the enemy wins. Don't give up. Keep believing. Keep standing. That's what you practice when they crash in their bikes now. You practice that so when they crash your car, you know what to do. You practice little things now. You think it's traumatic. You know, they get in a little fist fight with a friend. You know, you, you, got, you got big battles coming. Practice now. Getting on your knees, praying for him. I love this father. Watch what he does. This is the heavenly father in motion. He's full of compassion, which means he's not mad at his children. He's not angry at his kid. He'd work through those issues. It says in verse 20, while he was still a long ways off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son. Didn't, the son had only made his steps toward. Listen, when you start moving towards God, he moves towards you in a hurry. He, he does, he's not sitting there waiting, tapping his foot. Where you been, you moron? You know, that's, and I get it. Some of you came home to that. Some of you came home that to a dad that was just angry, didn't know how to forgive. Listen, dads, if you don't learn that, you know what, I know that this dad that forgave his son I don't know what his childhood was like, but I'm going to go out on the limb and say he'd made some pretty bad mistakes. He knew what it was to be forgiven. He knew what it was to have grace. You know, when you get grace, it's a lot easier to extend grace. When you know you failed, let me just help you. Every one of you came out of a dysfunctional family. If you think you had a dad that was perfect, then you have a different dysfunction. It's just called pride, and it's the worst kind. Every one of us, as good as your dad or mama, they were dysfunctional people. How do I know that? Because we're all dysfunctional. We're all sinners. God had dysfunctional children. They ran away from God. In the garden, Adam and Eve rebelled. They had it perfect. And then Cain kills his brother Abel. I mean, come on. It's a mess. Family life is a mess. If you came out of a messed up family, just celebrate it. But God ain't messed up. And he's a good daddy. You got a bad dad? I'm sorry. Get over it. You can't live the rest of your life that you had a bad dad or no dad. You got a good dad. His name's Jesus. And he's never missed a ball game. He's never missed one of your ensemble singing. He never missed your straight A's. He never missed when you were lonely laying in bed crying. He's never missed a moment. And I'm telling you, every kid grows up wanting their dad. I don't know what it is. They don't care about mom watching. My daughters, we take them to the pool. It was my time to read a book. Just relax, read a book. Kim would have her magazines. They never bothered mom. But every kid said, Dad, Dad, watch. Yeah, I'm watching. No, watch it. And you had to put the book down, look up, and watch this cannonball and go, wow, amazing cannonball. <laughs> and I had three. It, they never did it. Dad, dad, watch me. Watch. I can do bigger cannonball than that. That was not dad. Well, 
I'm watching. I went, no, what? You got to look up and what? That's, they never grow out. Husbands, they never grow out of that. They just get more subtle about it. What do you think, honey, about this? Yeah, that's fine. No, no, no. It looks amazing. I've never seen any woman look so great in my life. You look amazing. No, no, I, I, I'm going to try something else on. No, they never change. They want that approval, but they just get more subtle with it. And that's a good thing. We're just like it. I want to be noticed, and I want to know, and there's times you've ever been around, and, and you just, just uh, nobody noticed, but, but then you remind yourself, God knows what I just did or didn't do. He notices everything. He's a father that's never missed a day of my life. He's never given up on me in my lowest moments. He runs with compassion. He falls on his son and starts hugging and kissing this boy. Can you? And this is a stank and worms, pig food, stuff, sores. This is a kid that's starved. And this is a kid that's a mess. He's been an addict. He's been a mess. He doesn't deserve anything, but the father loves him because he's his. He's kissing and hugging on him. Verse 20 says, he threw his arms around him and kisses him and hugs him. It's in the midst of this. The kid's trying to confess. He says, Dad, he's trying to stop it. Dad, let me confess. Let me repent. He doesn't care. Forgiveness is already there. Doesn't mean it's wrong to confess. God expects it. God expects you to repent. If you want what this kid's getting, you got to come home to get it. You can't get it feeding the pigs. He still loved his son, but you can't hug him while he's feeding the pigs. He's got to decide to quit feeding the pigs and come home. And when he comes home, the dad's kisses, the dad's love. So the son's been rehearsing. It said earlier in the story, his confession, he's broken. He wants to say the right things. He starts into it. Verse 21, the son says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son in the middle of it. But the father... Cut him off. Doesn't cut him off with words. He's yet to say a word to this boy. He's kissed him. He's hugged him. He's wept over him. I love the next word. His first word the boy hears. The father says to his servants in verse 21. Excuse me, verse 22. But the father said to his servant, quick. Now, can you imagine them just start? They're all waiting. What's he going to do? They're watching this. They're standing around. They're serving. They're like the angels. They represent angels, I believe, in this story. God's servants. Or they could be us. And we're like, what's he going to do? Smack him, beat down? What's he going to do? Wow, he's emaciated. They're looking at him. They're judging him. How pitiful he looks. He's kissing all over him. Ah, that's nasty. He's loving on him. He's holding him. What's he going to do? What, what's he gonna do? Quick! I love this. Mercy runs faster than shame can ever imagine. Mercy outruns condemnation and guilt. Mercy runs past failure. Mercy is quick at the speed of the voice of the Father when he demands it. Quick! Do what? Go get the best robe. Not the secondary I'm going to give to the goodwill pile. Get the best robe. The best robe, not the one he squandered everything and he gets the second class robe. Not the one with a patch that says loser on it. Go get the best robe, the ring and the shoes. The robe covered his nakedness, covered his sores like the righteousness of Christ. The ring represents sonship. He didn't restore him as a hireling. He didn't bring him back as a a probation, under probation. Mercy doesn't make you sweat it. When you repent, God has a soft spot. It's called mercy. He loves to give it. He loves to give it. It Never runs out. Someone didn't beat you to it. Mercy. When you call on it, he shuts heaven down. Shh! Somebody's calling on mercy. Go get it. Go get them. Release the hounds of mercy. They come. The angels rally. The troops come. The supplies are released. The restoration has begun. Not my son. He's lost everything. He's not going to just forgive him. God never just puts a band-aid. God never just says, let's just start over and make sure pretend nothing happened. No, something did happen. You wear scars of what happened. You have pain of what happened. But I'm going to redeem that. 
and I'm going to raise you to a place you never were. A place higher than before you left. That the older brother is PO'd. He can't stand it. He stayed home. He's done the good boy. He's kept the duty. He's done everything, but he's not been with the father. He's going to elevate this boy to a new place. Put the ring on his finger. And then look what he says. Quick, quick. He goes and gets celebration calf. Verse 23. Bring the fatted calf. Kill it. No tears over that calf. That calf's destiny was to die. Every day, you're going to die. My boy's going to come home. And he's going to eat you. He's hungry. You're going to be food. And we're going to have a party. I love you, Celebration Calf. But, but you're going to die. You're going to die. You can you do anything you want. That calf was praying that boy wouldn't come home. He hated that boy. I don't, don't bring up his name. I don't, I don't even like to think about him. Everybody was the talk of the whole, all, all new, buddy, your day's coming. Your time is up. The boy's home. No more grain for you. What a party they're going to have. And then the dad says, let's party. My son was dead, and now he's alive. No greater miracle in the Bible than a prodigal coming home. Do you know that? That's why we've been baptizing people. There's no great, to, to, you know how quick it is? I was just thinking about that. I like the timing. Eight seconds you can win the world's record if you stay on a bull. Eight seconds. That's all it takes to qualify. You've got to have a good ride and you've got to beat out the other. Eight seconds. 1,001. 1,002. How long does it take to baptize somebody? I don't think it takes longer than eight seconds. It's quick. And it'll just push and back up. You're like, what is that? It represents the cleansing power of the love of God and the blood of Jesus. It represents a new beginning and from death to life. It represents put the new robe. I wish we had robes and we could just wrap everybody that gets baptized. We put a towel around them and we give them a cheesy little shirt that says change happened here. We don't give them a robe. We don't give them a ring and shoes, but God does. He's on duty. I want you to see that every time we baptize somebody. He's hollering for the angels. Hurry! Get down there. Get the robe on. Get the shoes on. Put the ring on. Hurry. I don't, you're busy singing. Stop singing. Get down there. Move. That's, you, don't see, you don't see God that way. God doesn't make suggestions. He gives commands. The father didn't say, hey, guys, if you're feeling it, just kind of run and don't get too big of a Hurry. That meant run. Why? What's the panic? It's not panic. It's celebration. I'm going to a party. I'm going to win. I'm, I've won my son back. Ah, that's the heart of this church right here. If you want to capture it in a message, what's the vineyard all about? Why do we do car shows and bull ridings and steaks and eggs? Why do we do, we do, why do, we do free movie nights and popcorn and things? Why do we give out hot dogs on bike nights and Halloweens? And why do we have such a warm welcome and a kind children's ministry? Why do we have an atmosphere of, of not judgmental and kindness when people have been far from God and we ring the bell? I don't know of another church on the planet. I'm sure there are. I'm not trying to be elitist. I'm just grateful we have a crazy crew of people that open a door and ring the bell. And we celebrate when people come back to Jesus. Why? Because that's the message of Jesus. Nothing stirs his heart. Winning the NBA championship. Being a, a, a warrior with a ring on. God goes, oh, that's boring. Super Bowl. Five rings. Who cares? You want to visit MJ better than LeBron? Who cares? cares it's got nothing to do heaven doesn't not the needle doesn't move when the nba championship needle doesn't move when the super when the patriots win another super bowl oh well did they win this year by the way oh they didn't they did i can't remember where's adam he was in the last service he would have told me they did win six or seven you know what god went <gasps> but somebody's getting baptized at the vineyard Shut down heaven. Get down there. See what's going on. Hurry. Bring the robe. Hurry. Get the ring. Hurt. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? He doesn't sweat us. He does. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to think about it for a while. I'll see. I want to see how what you've learned your lesson. No. He knew his son. He wanted to come home. He wanted to come home. People said, well, what, what if someone's getting baptized just to kind of 
Let me tell you something. If you walk up with your church clothes in the front of a crowd and to get baptized, something's going on inside your heart. You can't make people do that. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. It's something's going on in a heart that says, I want to come home. I want to see the Father wash me. Here's what I want to do. A little different, but if you're a, a man, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, spiritual father, going to be a dad. I had a teenager stand up here. He didn't participate because his dad said, he's not ready to have a kid yet. <laughs> like, All right. Not going to pray over having children, nothing like that. But if you're a man, I want you to come up. You don't have to talk. You don't have to say anything. I'm not going to embarrass you. You're not going to look at the people. They're scary. But you just come. Stand all the way across the front. I want to give you a gift. Come on. Every man. Boys can come, but if your dad says no, then don't put it on. I have a gift that we're going to give you. Just come to face you. You can start passing them out. Don't put them on yet. Don't worry about what color you get. There's no symbolism. You could trade with someone. You could punk them out if you don't like your color. All right, there's a bag going around. Grab a ring. Don't put it on yet. Don't put it on. And don't worry about what color you got. Come on, move up, move up, move up, move in. Come on, move up. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. What a group. What a group. Everybody gets one. Get a ring. Get a ring. It's symbolism. That's all. Don't put it on yet. If it wasn't getting creepy and weird, I'd have had someone put it on you. But I thought, nah, that's going to be creepy and weird. So we're not going to do that. Every now and then I think through things. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do like the story. Now, I just thought it'd be appropriate before we put on the ring, if you're here, maybe you've been far from God and this is your day to come home. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that Christ died for your sins, you should confess to your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Thursday night, I had three, four, five men say, I say yes to Jesus is Lord, just standing right like you are. If you're here, we want to ring the bell for you today. We want to celebrate before you put this ring on. I mean a whole lot more if you make your public confession. Now, you don't have to. I didn't bring you up here to try to force anybody to do anything. But I just it's, it, the ring will mean a whole lot more if you've made public your faith and say, I say yes to Jesus as my Lord. Just hold up your ring if you'd like to do that, and we'll just acknowledge and you just say, I say yes to Jesus as my Lord. Who needs to do that before we put these rings on? Come on. Be bold. Go ahead. Just do it. God bless you, man. God bless you. Someone else who wants to do that, needs to do that. <laughs> Someone's excited. Someone else, you'd like to do that this morning? Come on, be bold. I'm hoping some of you guys will say, today's the day I'm going to get baptized. Some of you have been baptized as a believer in Christ. That tank's real close. We won't push you in, though. So, all right, let's do the ring. I want you to close your eyes. I want to pray over you first. You're going to put it on whatever finger it fits, and it don't matter. Father, I just pray over these men. Church, stretch out your hands. Pray for them. There's families represented here, children, grandchildren, spiritual children. You have power and influence, men. You say, oh, no, I don't. Yes, you do. There's people that need your love. So I just want to pray off of you first. And if you have had a dad that maybe was delinquent, abusive, or he put something on you verbally, I want you to just take a moment and release him, forgive him. Say, Father, I forgive my dad for the things he said or the things he did to me or the things he didn't do. I forgive, I forgive him that he wasn't there when I needed him. I forgive him for being abusive. I forgive, whatever it is. Ladies, you sitting out there, you might need to do the same thing. You don't have to be up here to do it. Release forgiveness. And then anything that's been stuck in you like a curse, pray that off of you in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray the blood of Jesus over words that have bound and made prisoners of some of these men. Words like you'll never amount to anything, you're a loser, you're a failure, you're stupid. I rebuke those in Jesus' name. You'll never succeed. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. You're going to be just like me. Addictions, I rebuke in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we pray the blessing from, that can only come from you that this ring represents. 
that you say, you're my son. I love you. I believe in you. With those words, men, knowing the Father's love, do you put that ring on your own finger? Just as a reminder today, you're God's man, God's son. You have a father. Stop saying I don't have a dad or I haven't had a dad or I don't. You have a heavenly father. He's right here, right now, holding you and kissing you. Wash, wash minds, Lord. Give courage to men that have succumbed to the enemy's traps and snares. Father, we, we tend to be quitters and give up. We, get, we become cowards and we want to just run from responsibility. But Father, you're a God of courage. Put courage back in these men's hearts to follow you all the days of their lives. Bless them. Let the Father's blessing come upon you. Let the Father's blessing come upon you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. Now before you go anywhere, stand there real quick. All right, someone pull a, pull a card out. Come here, Tess, so no favoritisms unless you pull your husband's. He's already given a disclaimer. Okay, this is for your NFL ticket. There's about nine names on that side. Manuel Ramirez, Manny, right here. You win. So where's Pastor Jason? He's going to give you tickets to the NFL game coming up. All right, guys, you can go have a seat if you would. We're going to close in one last song. Unless you want to get baptized, then we're going to be right here. We're going to sing one last song. Then we're going to go eat some barbecue, ride a bull, look at cars, and have fun. Have fun. I know of one we've got to baptize. So if there's more than one, make your way down. Don't wait. We're baptizing this fine young man right here. Go ahead and take it. Come on, come on. You getting baptized today, aren't you? Come on. Gloria a Dios. Cuanto años? 83 years old. Getting baptized today. 83, baby. Como, como te amo? Como se amo? Como se amo? Juan. Come on, Juan. You lead us today. You're not going to be the only one, Juan. We're going over 60 today, baby. Come on. Who else is going to get baptized today? Come on. It's your day. We got a towel, shirt. You can go drip dry out there. Barbecue still eat good. You'll be fine. I know we got several more. So you come on. We're going to sing. Stand up together with us. Juan, come on to the tank. You getting baptized, buddy? She is. He is. Who we got? It? Come on. Come on, Juan. Stretch out your hand, church. Gloria a Dios, Gloria a Dios.
is this? What's her name? Alicia. Alicia's giving her heart to Jesus. And Grandma says, it's okay to get baptized. Come on. It's Alicia. Come on. This is Dave and Kelly's grandbaby, and they've inherited them for now. They have how many did you get? They have three grandchildren, and they've been with us for several years now, and it's required because they brought them in. They're going to have to move back to uh, Augusta. Are you going back to Augusta? Georgia, going back to Georgia to take care of these grandbabies. So I want you to bless David. He's often been on our prayer team. Here he is in a wheelchair. He'll be up there this morning. If you need prayer, I wouldn't have anybody else pray for me. He'll pray over you. Kelly, we just say we love you guys. Thank you for being heroes, taking these babies in, being being a dad all over again when you thought you were done. And, and we want to bless them. Let's pray over them and then you'll go on your way. Have an incredible day. Don't forget, get your armband things and we're going to have fun if you're a guest come on up meet us we'd love to meet you have have fun today dads relax you get an A today start over this is a do over let's bless them father thank you for David thank you for Kelly for stepping up taking in these grandbabies Lord I just pray for grace on them Lord send them out with our blessing Lord they've been good people never a burden they could have complained every day never complain. I just pray your richest blessing, health, strengthen their bodies. Let your joy fill this house. Let these little girls hear laughter, fun, and love in this home. Bless them, Lord. And bless this day with every dad here. Let them feel loved and blessed today, Lord. We all wish we'd been better dads, but we're grateful you're the best dad. And we give you our praise. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great day.